the, tr the correct, honest way would be to say, hmm, is that a big number? Then, well, I wonder if it's possible. And that's it. Number two, it's very deep in human psyche, in the human psyche, in the human mind. Our history of the human race uh, that we can go back to reaches about 5,000 years. And in all these 5,000 years, written, or at least claimed to be written, there has never been even one generation on this earth in our entire history where the idea of the supernatural has been wiped off. Never! Not even one single generation. It is so deep, and if something lasts for 10 years, we must give it some credibility, don't you think? If somebody, if some, that same idea lasts for a century, then there is a certain credibility that is inherent right there. If it lasts for thousands of years, in billions of people's minds, then I believe the correct way to look at it is, there's a possibility. Number three is the presence of design. Like we said just a moment ago, it is not design that is bitty and small. It is precise, it is complex, it is huge. And right here I might appeal to another science, the science of archaeology. Have you ever heard of an archaeologist who very carefully goes to his dig and brushes off the dust from a little ornate pillar, for instance, with nice markings there? And he says this is a prize find in his dig and he brings it to his table and puts it there, stands back and it said happened by itself. Never. From a broken piece of pottery, a broken piece of pottery. An archaeologist looking at those markings and the color and whatever else he wants to look at will tell you when it was made, which country, possibly the language the person spoke, his social status, maybe his financial status too. Why do we give him that credibility? because of the very simple, logical, stepwise approach that anything that is a design requires the explanation of having a designer somewhere along the way. If you see a design, there must be a designer. And that is why he will brush off the, the, the dirt, but keep this pillar. The dirt obviously does not have a design. He is not interested in that. The pillar has a design. And so when he looks at a design, he starts working on the idea of who the designer is. And that is why we have so much of historical evidence of our past. Because you see any design, it calls for a designer. And the characteristics of the designer. The fact is really, he threw off the dirt. And what if I tell you, or what if I tell the archaeologist, if you look carefully into dirt and look at the molecules that form the dirt, there is a precise design in the dirt itself. Then shouldn't the archaeologist go looking for the designer of that as well? Yes, of course. Any design, if you did it at that place, why do you not do it in this place too? So to be consistent, any design, your first bet shouldn't be that it happened by itself. You must look for the designer. And the design, right, is anything but small. If there's a broken vase, can you look just at the jagged edge and say there's no design here? A broken vase is still a vase. Why? Because despite the broken edge, you see design in the rest of it. In other words, if any phenomenon, if any place has design and non-design within it, then the design takes precedence. And you do look for a designer. But these are all only circumstantial evidences. We go to anthropic principle. This word anthropos means human, 
It was coined by Brandon Carter, a British physicist, and it talks about those factors that allow humans or life to exist on any planet. Factors that contribute to and sustain human life on a planet. We're going to look at two of them, maintenance of life and conditions for research. Maintenance of life. The expansion rate. Do you know that our, our universe is expanding? And it is expanding at a certain rate. If it goes a little slower or a little faster, life would be impossible. And look what the number is. Take the expansion rate of the universe, which is fine-tuned to one part in a trillion, 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 trillion. That is, if it were changed by one part in either direction, a little faster, a little slower, we could not have a universe that would be capable of supporting life. Just the expansion rate. Gravity. It's incomprehensibly narrow range. The strongest nuclear force on, in nature is called the strong nuclear force, which holds protons and the neutrons together in the center of an atom. That is the strongest force that we know in nature. The weakest force that we know in nature is gravity. Even a little ant will lift a leaf against gravity. It's the weakest force in nature. Now suppose you draw a line and put millimeter marks on the line and draw the line out from here around the world and go off to the moon and onto the sun 93 million miles away and go clean across our galaxy and swing this line out to the 10,000th galaxy. Now it's gone past our minds. Millimeter marks on this line. And then the scale of, of the power that's in the universe, the spectrum is, if the strong nuclear force is way out on the 10,000th galaxy. Gravity is on millimeter number one. That's the spectrum. Now what will happen if you shift gravity to millimeter two on that line that goes from here to the 10,000th galaxy? All you're going to shift it is from one millimeter to two. Do you know what will happen? Our Earth which is 7,000 miles in diameter, will shrink to a, a globe that is only 40 miles in diameter. All life will cease. If you just shift gravity to the second millimeter mark, and that is why they say that gravity has an incomprehensibly narrow range for life to exist. If the fine-tuning of this statement, I didn't put it up there, but this is called the cosmological constant. Don't worry about these big names. The cosmological constant is just the density of matter in space, the whole of space. The density of matter has to be a very correct amount. If it is too much, all matter will collapse, all galaxies will collapse. If it is too little, they'll all fly apart. It has to be very fine-tuned to a billion, hundred million, billion, 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 billion. That's the number. So in other words, it moves one mark away, gone. Who is controlling all of that? When you combine the two, gravity and cosmological constant, the fine tuning would be to precision of one part in a hundred million, trillion, 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 trillion. That would be the equivalent of one atom in the entire known universe. Take all the atoms. Look, in my body itself, I'm not a big guy. I have about 75 trillion cells. 75 trillion cells, not atoms, cells. So you line up all these cells and then break them up into atoms and line all the atoms, yours, mine, the trees, the mountains, the seas, this earth, moon, planets, everything, 125 billion galaxies. And if the needle was supposed to be on atom number 510, that's where it is. It is not on 509, it's not on 511. Fine-tuned, absolutely fine-tuned. How about a situation? Now, it's not a, it's not a place like, you know, front row and oh, I don't want to sit in the front row here, I want to sit in the side here. No, it's a position in the galaxy. Our position in the galaxy, we happen to be situated safely between the Sagittarius and Perseus spiral arms. I cannot come up with an example of another place in the galaxy that is as friendly to life as our location. Any other place will have too much of radiation, for instance, 
and we would cease to exist. It's only in the very inner edge of the circumstellar habitable zone, that is, the distance from the sun, in which we have low enough carbon dioxide and high enough oxygen to sustain complex animal life and human life like yours and mine, and that's where we are. Who put us there? Over the past 30 years or so, scientists have discovered that just about everything about the basic structure of the universe is balanced on a razor's edge for life to exist. Conditions for research. Do you know that this earth is, according to what we can observe in the universe, the only place in the universe where you can see and experience a total solar eclipse. The moon is 232,000 miles away from us and it occupies an area in the sky that much. The sun is 400 times the mass of the moon and it is exactly 400 times away. And so it also occupies the exact same area in the sky and that is why we can have a total solar eclipse because they occupy the exact same area in the, in the, in the atmosphere. So what's so great about a total solar eclipse? Well, scientists tell us that it is the only phenomenon during which they can study the color spectrum of our sun. A certain color spectrum is, uh, is available only during a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse. And because of that, we can extrapolate and study other stars. So, conditions for research. Not only that, Einstein's theory of relativity is a theory and a mathematical calculation and a formula that relates to all existence of the whole universe. This is the existence of matter in a total solar eclipse. That is the only phenomenon where you can observe one part of Einstein's theory of relativity which says gravity can bend light. Can you imagine that? This earth is the only place where you can have an observable part of Einstein's theory of relativity nowhere else. In every other place in the universe it will be a theory. Here we have, can observe it because there is a total solar eclipse going on. And why? Because these bodies are exactly positioned in the distance they are and the size they are. Amazing? Amazing, wow, no? <laughs> it's that incredible coincidence that creates a perfect match. How about our location? Our location away from the galaxy center in the flat plane of the disk provides us with a particularly privileged vantage point for observing both nearby and distant stars. The very composition of our atmosphere gives it transparency. If not, we wouldn't have been able to observe anything outside our Earth. It is this that we find a universe where the very places where we find observers are also the very best over places for observing. That is surprising. I see design in this pattern of habitability, meaning the factors that allow us to live, and measurability, the factors that allow us to do scientific measurements. <laughs>